I want to thank our, um, before we go into our, our session, because I know once you hear our amazing speaker, you're not going to want to listen to this anymore. So I'm getting it out of the way now. Thank you so much to Mary Aspinall, co-chair Jason Jardine, who I think is hiding right now as he's trying to wrangle the last people back into the room. Um, all of our AZ Bio board members, all of our presenting companies, I have heard great things about what you did today. Um, and most important, all of our investors, um, open your checkbooks, tell your friends, spread the news. Life science innovation does not happen if we don't support it. So, um, you know, you heard about some amazing things today. Let's turn amazing possibilities into life-changing realities. And with that, thank you, Joan, for your continued leadership. Thank you. And with that, I want to talk to have you have some conversations with one of the leading cancer researchers, innovators, and champions for patients in the United States, if not the whole world. So please welcome me, join me, sorry, it's been a long day and the mind is going. Uh, it has, but please join me in welcoming Dr. Stephen Rosen. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So, first of all, thank you. Thank you. It is so great to have you here with us. And, you know, as we get started, you know, okay, I, I gave you a big buildup, okay? You're the most famous, you're the greatest, you're the most important. <laughs> my my uh, father would have believed you. <laughs> no, <laughs> How about your mother? No, my mother no, knew, I, I know that my mother knew the <laughs> truth. Um, but, you know, we all start on our journey from different ways. And one of my favorite questions that I, it's when I'm asking world-class physician researchers is, did you always want to be a doctor? Mm -hmm. So mine is an unusual journey. I was born in uh, Brooklyn, New York. When I was eight, we moved to Queens. And I went to an inner city high school. In those years, if you had any aptitude, you were skipped because the schools were overcrowded. And then I went to Northwestern University because my father, who had not gone to college, had this image of me playing college football in the Big Ten. I was a very good college, I was a high school football player, but in Pop Warner Leagues, they didn't have those uh -huh. schools. And I'll never forget arriving, and I weighed 175 pounds, was in good shape, and Mike Adamley, who was my height, five, nine and a half, he was 225 pounds and like a rocket, and so I knew that wasn't gonna happen. Uh, and I, at the time, if, if you had said to me, what do you want to do in your life, I probably wouldn't have a concrete answer, but I was leaning towards being a journalist, actually a sports writer. And it was during the Vietnam War, and Northwestern's on a quarter system, and in the third quarter, the school closed for campus unrest. And so my roommate at Northwestern was pre-med, a friend who had also gone to Northwestern was pre-med, and they went to hear about the expansion of this program where you would go right from normally high school, um, you'd be accepted to go to medical school in two years. So I just signed in with them. I knew I had good grades, but uh, two days later I get a phone call and they want to interview me to go into the medical school program. And I interviewed with, ironically, someone who years later was under me when I was cancer center director, and he said he just liked me and he accepted me to medical school. So uh, I'll never forget calling my parents and saying, you're not gonna believe this, this was like on a Monday. I just got accepted to medical school. And they said, you never talked about it. I said, I never did. <laughs> and and uh, my father, who didn't like doctors, said, did you sign anything? You sure you have to do this? And, and, and so the windup was, I went into the program and a year later I was supposed to go to medical school. And I'm 18 years old, very immature. And I said, I can't do this. But my mother convinced me to ask them if I could postpone it a year. And that actually turned out to be one of the best decisions, even though it was very difficult, because I took a year of economics, of literature, a biology course, but most importantly, I went to a laboratory. And we were, uh, at that time, trying to grow cells. It was actually cutting off a lizard's tail, which regrows, and we we're trying to understand what the mechanism was, what were the uh, cytokines being produced, and cell culture was just evolving. And so after uh, college, I went to Northwestern University Medical School, 
Um, I had no dexterity. I knew I couldn't be a surgeon. I didn't have the patience to be a pediatrician and ended up in internal medicine. And then a dear friend uh, lost a leg to a sarcoma, and that led me into oncology. And uh, again, it was good fortune. There happened to be a last minute opening at the National Cancer Institute, and so that's where I went and trained. And after training there, I came back to Northwestern. And um, I uh, was a clinician scientist. There weren't many back then. Uh, but the Cancer Center had gotten a sort of courtesy grant from the National Cancer Institute when a Dr. Berlin had left the NCI to come to Northwestern, but they immediately lost it. And so they were trying to recruit a distinguished figure in the field, mm -hmm. and no one wanted to come. There weren't much resources, et cetera. And I was a young father with, with uh, uh, elementary school children, and I just needed to make more money. And um, they ultimately came to me and they said that they wanted me to do it on an interim basis. And I was going to take it because they were going to raise my salary. But then uh, a colleague, Paul Bunn, who was at the University of Colorado and a cancer center director, said, if you do it as an interim, you can't compete for the major grant from the federal government. And so they gave me the position, and we uh, got the grant. And I subsequently have renewed it five times at Northwestern, where I was for 25 years. And then I became the cancer center director at City of Hope and the director of the Beckman Research Institute. Uh, 10 years ago in LA, and I just love it. And for those of you who have not been to City of Hope, you have to come visit, it's, it's a remarkable place. Uh, just this week, we did our 1700th CAR T cell treatment. And uh, we have the leading you know, transplant program in America, and on and on and on. Yeah. And you didn't have anything to do with building that? Uh, I, I've been engaged in, so when I first came, uh, there were two priorities I decided upon were cellular therapeutics, which is CAR T therapy, bispecific antibodies, allogeneic transplant, et cetera. And the second was precision medicine, and that's how we ultimately acquired uh, TGen, because I wanted to leapfrog in precision medicine and being one of the leading uh, institutions to be able to dissect the molecular alterations in a cancer and also look for inherited risk. So um, I put your entire you know, CV on our website, which if I sent read it, there wouldn't be enough time left in our session for any conversations, right? Because mm -hmm. you've done so much. And, um, but one of the things that really stood out to me was how almost everything that you've worked on has been a team effort. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And whether it's in research or bringing researchers together or funding research, why is that important and how has that made you so successful? Well, it's important because uh, each of us has strengths in the domain that we're comfortable with, uh, but uh, science moves in a very shallow pace if you're just focused on your own domain, unless it may be some sort of technical advance. But uh, it's so healthy to have dialogue with people who are coming at the same problem from different perspectives. When I first started at City of Hope, uh, we had eight multi-PI NCI grants. Last year, when I transitioned out of that role, we had 85. So the culture changed where people all started to collaborate, go in together, uh, bring their expertise in each of their areas. Uh, it's critical, uh, and you know, I was talking earlier to some brilliant young fellows from Tucson who do informatics, and mm -hmm. my God, I, I have no strengths in informatics, but I work with world-class individuals in informatics, and what I learn from them, what can be accomplished uh, in the domains that, that I'm investigating is spectacular. I remember um, you know, sitting down with some of the folks from TGen, and when I came to this job, I had no basis in science. Mm. And um, I was blessed that, you know, Eric Ryman explained what Alzheimer's is to me. Mm -hmm. And Jeff Trent, um, you know, helped me understand the different kinds of omics. And um, when it came to proteomics, Josh LeBaire sat me down mm -hmm. and did that. And then Josh and Mara had the patience of sitting next to me and to helping me figure out the first time I got my full genome re sequence report, what it meant. Mm -hmm. 
Um, my job brings different skills, right, than mm -hmm. yours. I look at your team at Slam Bio, and you've built this amazing team there, um, and each brings a different skill set. Now, organizations tend to come together to combine mm -hmm. because they have different skill sets. TGEN's a cornerstone of our, how we built our bioscience sector on. Help me understand how the whole TGEN City of Hope thing came mm -hmm. to be. This is an amazing story. It's actually a, a made-for-TV series. Uh, that part, so I mentioned that when I first started, precision medicine was a priority. Mm -hmm. And I decided I'd start a department, and I recruited or tried to recruit someone from University of Chicago, Kevin White, who had skills in that domain. Kevin was excited. Uh, he was about to come, but his wife, who's Russian by ancestry, didn't want to leave Chicago. And Eric Lepkowski had started Tempus in Chicago. He's been very open about this. His wife is diagnosed with breast cancer. He was shocked at how little physicians knew about a lot of the nuances of the disease. Uh, I remember when I met with uh, Eric, he said, I can tell you what you're going to eat on Saturday. And because of all of the informatics, he said, but yet physicians provide so little information when they're um, evaluating specific patient issues. So Kevin went to work for Eric. There was a brief period of time where we were negotiating to see whether we would partner with Eric, but it was clear not going to be in City of Hope's best interest. So at that time, a number of institutions in Southern California saw scripts, there were a few others, uh, they needed uh, some financial support, potentially an endowment, and they reached out to us to dialogue. Uh, and the one that was most appealing was the Allergy Immunology Institute that happened to be on the University of California, San Diego's mm -hmm. campus. And I thought this could solve our needs. Uh, and we started a dialogue, so that it allowed the business people at City of Hope to get some experience talking about this. And then in the University of California, San Diego said, there's no way we're going to let City of Hope be on our campus. And they worked out a deal uh, with the allergy immunology. So I was sort of back to square one. So I know it's a convoluted story, but it's worth listening to it when I get to the end. So the, at that point, um, there was a gentleman from Chicago who wanted me to create a relationship with Israeli scientists. And so he gave us a million dollars a year to do collaborative work with Israeli scientists. And we ran it through the Israel Cancer Research Fund. So mm -hmm. they would bet the projects. I get a phone call from a woman who I knew from Chicago. She was involved in the American Cancer Society. And she was now the partner of a very successful, uh, wealthy pharmaceutical executive. His name is John Kapoor. And many of you may know who John Kapoor is. <laughs> so John. Uh, reached out to me. He, he wanted me to establish a observership for surgeons from India. And I said, fine, but I wanted to meet with him to see if he would do something similar to the fellow who did the Israeli scientist from program, which was much more extensive, and it, it led to a number of important exchanges. So I went and had lunch with him. He was charming. Um, for those of you who aren't unaware, he ultimately ends up in prison, and there's a series about him using the opioids, uh, and the person who plays him in the movie is uh, not as charming. <laughs> and, it comes, and doesn't come across at, at like John Kapoor, but uh, be that, that as it may, he had a very good product. You would spray the fentanyl into your mouth and you immediately get pain relief, and for cancer patients it's wonderful, but they apparently were pushing it on individuals who didn't need this and led to a lot of opioid deaths, et cetera. So I finished my lunch with John, I had the whole day to kill. I had nothing going on. And Dan Van Hoff, I suspect many of you probably know Dan Van Hoff. Maybe I raise a hand. So, yeah, so everyone knows Dan Van Hoff. Dan was a fellow at the NCI a few years ahead of me. So I knew him, and he was a legend, even as a fellow. And I thought, oh, I'd go visit with him at TGEN. And I thought TGEN was a pharmaceutical company. I knew nothing about it. And I arrive, and John Carpton is there. Dan wasn't mm -hmm. out. And John Carpenter, ironically, has now succeeded me as the Cancer Center Director and Director of the Beckman Research Institute at City of Hope. And he's a renowned uh, geneticist, informatician, a wonderful guy. And when I told him that we were trying to leapfrog in precision medicine, it sounded like they had really made great progress, he brought Jeff Trenton. And I didn't know Jeff personally, but I knew him by reputation because he 
was a leader at Michigan, then he was a deputy director at the NIH, and then he came and started TGen. He's a real true visionary. And so the business people at City of Hope had gone through the experience of negotiating a relationship. Uh, Robert Stone and Harlan Levine immediately appreciated that TGen was going to be a valuable asset. So we essentially acquired TGen, and TGen is now City of Hope. Uh, I was one of the individuals who said, let's not change the name. The name was very powerful at the time. And so we almost uh, viewed TGen like we view uh, the Beckman Research Institute as a component of City of Hope, but it's all under the City of Hope umbrella. Mm -hmm. And um, the interesting thing that, you know, it's, it's funny how you can't predict in life. I was so worried how we we're going to present to the National Cancer Institute the relationship with TGEN when they're in Phoenix and we're in Duarte and it's always an issue. There's always someone who says, well, you, you don't see each other. How can you work together? Well, COVID happened. And with COVID, everything became virtual. You didn't know whether someone was in the next uh, floor uh, versus being at TGEN. And that disappeared as an issue. And even today, now that we do everything in a virtual world and, and less frequently all meet together, mm -hmm. it, it, it hasn't been a consideration uh, TGen has had so many innovative spin outs, it's c quite remarkable. So, and, and thank you for doing that because mm. I think that, and, and I remember when John Carpton was here. Yeah. And I also remember how sad I was when I saw him. Well, I was happy for him, but sad for us when I saw him leave. Yeah and go to City of Hope and look at that, it all comes yeah. full circle. He, in, in the interim, he went to USC for a few yeah. years and then he made his, his way to us. Those yeah. California people, they, they're always stealing. You yeah, know, we, right. we need to steal them back. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we, we talked about genomics and precision medicine and before that it was personalized medicine and all of the different things that go with it. Um, but we've also heard earlier today about AI and drug development. As a physician who's working with patients, how important is it for us to be able to find answers that will, on what will work or not work faster? Oh my God, uh, and this actually is something that uh, Dan Van Hoff was the, one of the first to say, uh, when you have a, a cancer, the urgency he would always say, uh, wait is a four letter word, you know, cancer that you can't, you, know, you really uh, have this anxiety. In fact, just before a physician called me because he had an imaging study and he shows he has a large mass, he was beside himself and he you know, obviously wants to know how quickly can we do the biopsy, how quickly can we move forward. Um, I think artificial intelligence is already ha having a transformative effect at every level in radiology, pathology, uh, in basic research where rather than looking how two pathways may interact, you can look at thousands of pathways and how they interact, which will hopefully lead to a better understanding how to develop synergistic drugs, uh, also to un better understand toxicities mm -hmm. that may exist. Uh, we've been using artificial intelligence to look at drug reactions um, and uh, we're using social media quite a bit. Uh, you would be shocked at uh, how quickly you can get information. I'll give you, we give you two examples that we published. One was on the COVID vaccine, where we looked at every tweet for two months. And this was a college student doing it, and looked at every time a side effect from the vaccine was mentioned. It turns out that every side effect mentioned ultimately was reported to the CDC or uh, one of the other agencies, mm -hmm. and, and usually, in those agencies, you're lucky if one in 100 individuals report it. Uh, when you use social media and you, and you look at hundreds of thousands of individuals, they all start to come together. Uh, Paxlovid's another great example. Uh, the CDC, the FDA, Pfizer, they all said there's no such thing as Paxlovid rebound and they, from the trial. Well, Joe Biden had it, Jill Biden had it, Fauci had it, um, Walensky had it. It was all on social media, and we picked it up, and that, that was you know, just submitted. Uh, um, Marty Tannenbaum is a friend of mine, uh -huh. and I think you've met Marty before. And, and, and he truly believes that his ability, and at the time, he mm -hmm. had what most people didn't have access to, which was huge data because of his mm -hmm. tech career, but he truly believes that his life was saved because he was able to find mm -hmm. the right match for his cancer 
Mm -hmm. And um, you know these new technologies hopefully will spur mm -hmm. that. I know that um, you know City of Hope and TGen, um, and now CTCA is part of City of Hope also um, has done a lot of work on you know these new mm -hmm. leading edge treatments. Mm -hmm. Right. Why is it that a UCI cancer center or a um, you know an organization like City of Hope is better positioned to do that kind of groundbreaking work than a community health center? Uh, resources and a total focus on just cancer. And we get enormous resources. Uh, first, philanthropy. I think last year over $300 million in philanthropy came to the City of Hope. Uh, the people who go to work there are very interested in the science as well as patient care. You know, my, I get on an elevator and someone says, tell me about City of Hope. I'll say, well, we provide the finest care to patients and their families, but we also make the discoveries that benefit all of humanity. And so all of the faculty is driven to make discoveries that'll benefit people. And we collaboratively work, uh, and we have a very cordial relationships with uh, our colleagues at other institutions. We have a very intimate relationship, for instance, with Caltech which is 15 minutes away, and, and we work together. Well, and you've had, I mean, visitors from all over the world yeah. come to City of Hope, and... Mm -hmm. um, Though it's interesting now, again, uh, because of COVID, it used to be I'd fly someone in from, say, uh, New York. We, don't, we never were flying people in from overseas. That would be rare, but mm -hmm. say New York. And in the end, it would cost you $10,000 to fly the person out, take them to dinners, on and on. And if we had a lunch meeting and 25 people showed up, I'd be happy, right? Now with virtual, a person can be in New York, give the hour lecture, get the same honorarium, and we'll have 200 people watching from their office online, mm -hmm. and, uh, and the graphics are better. Uh, you know, and so it's, that's the reality. And, also, and so now we have people from all over the world presenting. It's not restricted to the contiguous 48 states. Yep. Yeah. It can be everywhere. Now, although I've heard that um, you've met with some pretty important people, even In royalty. My, I have. That's been uh, one of the blessings of the position. Uh, Princess Di was my guest when I was at Northwestern for three days when she was going through her divorce. That was an interesting experience. Uh, Ernie Banks, a uh, famous baseball player who many of the men may know, I, don't know, or I shouldn't say that, sexist. Many, many people may know, uh, you know. So <laughs> the, uh, yeah. he, he um, took me to a ball game with Muhammad Ali. I spent nine innings wiping his forehead and chit-chatting with it was fun. Uh, and Lance Armstrong and I rode uh, 10 speeds through the Chicago Loop together for an event, which was an interesting experience. Uh, because there were about 150 journalists around him. And then one journalist came up to me to, to say, what's the significance of Lance Armstrong for your work? And I remember saying, it should be self-apparent. There are 150 people that want to speak to him, and you're only speaking to me because you can't get close to him. <laughs> and, and so, yeah, it's... The, you know. that, that works. We, we have a company here, Anavive, and they um, are working on a, a treatment for valley fever. Mm, yeah. Um, they brought Gronk with them mm. to Congress. It was standing room only. Yeah. Yeah. So, hey, yeah. use what works, guys. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we've seen all these enabling technologies. Yeah. We've seen all these fabulous things happening. Um, but it's not always good. I mean, we, as we've seen with, and we talked about COVID vaccines earlier. Mm -hmm. As we've seen with the internet during the pandemic, it was a blessing that we had the internet that we could get this information out to the people. Mm -hmm. It was also a curse because we spread a tremendous amount of disinformation mm -hmm. that probably cost lives. Mm -hmm. As we look at these new technologies like AI, like gene editing, like you know, some of these new things that are coming down the pike, how do we move innovation forward Safely. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to be challenging. Um, funny, I'm right at the present time listening to the biography of Louis Brandeis, who was a Supreme Court justice at the turn of the 1900s. And his two major issues were privacy 
and the right to free speech. And that becomes major issues now as we mm -hmm. deal with AI and all the complexities. Uh, I have an avatar uh, that was done of me, and this is fascinating. I don't know, how many of you know what an avatar is or have seen it? So, oh, see, okay. So uh, they asked me if it was okay. I said, what was involved? They said, well, you, you'll sign a consent that we would never use it unless you approve of the material, and we want to use it at a Congress that was coming up on blood cancers. And so I said, okay. So what do you want me to talk about? They said, talk about anything you like. I said, what do you mean talk about anything you like? Mm -hmm. They said, well, what's going on in your life right now? I said, well, I was watching the NBA playoffs. They said, talk about the NBA playoffs. So I'm talking about the NBA playoffs, and they'll, they say, oh, move your hands more, you know, do this and this. So I did it all. And so, and I'm in my white coat. Mm -hmm. And so I then go to the meeting, and they sent me a script. And I read the script, and they said, is it accurate? I said, yeah, it's accurate, okay. I go to the meeting, and I see my avatar and my, my voice doing the script, not talking baseball, but the script, actually, it's phenomenal. So obviously, it could be used in a way that could be embarrassing, uh, but also, it could be very powerful, uh, and I'll give you an example, in clinical trials where you want to present information to individuals of different backgrounds, different languages. Um, uh, you may prefer to have a, a woman talk to you. You may prefer to have someone who has the same racial identity talk to you about the trial. It's now trivial to do. Yeah. And they, they can change the, the language as an example. They can change it in five minutes. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, yeah, it's... But then comes the question of, did we deceive that person mm -hmm. by delivering, you know, a, a message, a face, an impression mm -hmm. that's culturally correct for them, but really didn't come from that they would have, I would assume they would have had to approve the document, though, yeah. yeah. But, yeah. But, I mean, that yeah. those are all things that we're struggling with right now. Right. And, um, you know, when, when we talk about patients, I think it, it is important to, to, and we've said this multiple times today, but patients, I mean, that's what, why we do what we do. That's mm -hmm. why we research. That's why mm -hmm. we invest. That's why we manufacture. That's why we deliver. That's why we treat. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, new legislation this, in this administration, like the Inflation Reduction Act, um, did some, some good things, mm -hmm. right? I mean, personally, I think it's unconscionable that there are patient co-pays on cancer medicines. Mm -hmm. There shouldn't be one, mm -hmm. okay? You didn't choose to get cancer. It's not a lifestyle-altering thing like an excise tax on cigarettes, right? You got cancer, mm -hmm. you should have the medicine. And so the IRA does start to close that gap at least down to $2,000, which is still a hardship for a lot of mm -hmm. cancer patients. Um, but we also have seen things that negatively impact innovation out of that. You know, obviously, and I'm not gonna debate whether the drug companies get, make too much money on their drugs or not, what we are going to see is that you know hundreds of billions of dollars are going to come out of the life science ecosystem that's used for investing in new health innovations. Mm -hmm. And that is a serious concern. But beyond that, we have um, you know a provision that says if you are a biologic and you're novel, you get a buy for 13 years before we can put price controls on you. Mm -hmm. If you're a drug, a pill, small molecules get nine. Mm -hmm. And that's now shifting how drug companies invest. Mm -hmm. And it's shifting how investors invest. As a cancer doc, mm -hmm. Why is it so dangerous that we would penalize the development of small molecule drugs versus large molecule drugs? You want me to defend, defend it? I can't defend it. I, 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 <laughs> Why? I, think, I think it's a mistake. Um, you know, I was talking to Steve Potts, who's the CEO of SlamBio, and he was telling me that the profitability for the small molecule can be half that of the biologic just because of the time frame. 
uh, not because of the value. Uh, it's uh, something that I don't understand. I, I don't know how that law got passed, and, and, and I'm sure whoever designed the law had some sort of rationale, but it doesn't seem appropriate. Well, they, so I can actually tell you where they cut it. Yeah. So when they were putting this together, so in order to get the help for the patients on the copays, mm -hmm. they had to have something called a pay for. So mm -hmm. you had to balance the scale. Mm -hmm. So they figured, well, the drug companies make too much money and they're horrible people, so we'll take the money from them. Mm -hmm. And I'm kidding, it didn't, it didn't go quite that way. Um, but what did come out of it was when they were trying to figure it out, for years we had talked about with patents and IP that we needed more time for biologics than for chemistry drugs because it took longer to develop them. Mm -hmm. And so on the patent side, we had that 9 and 13. So when they were trying to come up with something for, for the IRA, they went with the same standard they use in patents, which is 9 and 13. But as we know in drug delivery, once the product actually gets to that stage, it's a different standard. Mm -hmm. But physiologically, I mean, large molecules can do things that small molecules can't. But there's some very, very important things that small molecule drugs can do that large molecule drugs can, can't, right? Oh, there's no question about that. And in the diseases that I treat, I use both um, antibody-based products, whether it's a single antibody, a bispecific, a CAR-T, uh, and I have many uh, patients on small molecules against specific enzymes. Uh, if you use chronic lymphocytic leukemia as an example, patient has an option of being treated with two oral small molecules or with one oral small molecule and a biologic. Uh, the results are pretty similar in terms of the efficacy, side effects slightly different, uh, but there are many effective uh, considerations for the patient. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. See, because you got to explain this to me. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I'm the wrong person to explain well, how can, that happened. You can explain the medicine to me. Yeah. That, that's but the important one part. One thing, uh, again, with the, uh, uh, what do they call it? That's, I always block on the name. The, IRA? Yes, that's the Inflation Reduction Act. Mm -hmm. yeah, the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, part of it was to reduce the cost of select medications. Mm -hmm. So one of the... the maybe the only cancer medicine I think of the 10 is Imbruvica, mm -hmm. which is a BTK inhibitor. And when first it was used for mantle cell lymphoma and then a variety of other B cell malignancies, including CLL. And it's a very effective drug, it was a breakthrough drug, no question about it, uh, but it's quite toxic. It causes atrial fibrillation in, in as many as 20% of patients who have um, uh, taken it chronically. And so now we have next generation drugs that are much better. Mm -hmm. The implementation of the IRA will be in 2026. By that time, very few of us are going to be using Imbruvica, even though it's the one drug they focus on. And one of the concerns I've heard from colleagues is that because its cost will come down dramatically, formularies may insist that the doctors use it because it's still available and it'll save money, uh, even though it's not the best drug. And, and could be dangerous for certain and, and, patients. And right, and could be dangerous. So, so, yeah, there's, there's a lot of difficult decisions that have to be made. And I think that, I mean, we do recognize, I think, as physicians and as an industry that, you know, care toxicity, mm -hmm. can, you know, the, the, the cost of care, you know, some, sometimes is worse than the disease for a family. Oh, yes. We're actually doing some research right now on final, financial toxicity in a variety of the blood cancers or patients are on endless therapies. And it's really looking at the stress that it, it causes. The, you know, one thing I have struggled with, and maybe there are individuals in the room who could better answer this than me, uh, the fact that the United States will pay X amount of money for a drug and other industrialized countries pay a fraction of that. Why are we underwriting England, Canada, France, uh, why 
aren't they paying the same amount? Then maybe that would reduce the cost to our population. Right. You know, some of the challenges we've seen with that, and mm -hmm. as I'm an economist, I'm not yeah. a doctor, so we looked at that, and one of the big challenges is that we have a different structure than those single-payer healthcare systems. Mm -hmm. So we have distributors, we have PBMs, we have independent pharmacists, we have all of these levels across the supply chain, mm -hmm. and each one gets paid. And so when you see a drug, and I'm just gonna use very round numbers, a drug that costs $100 in the United States and costs $25 in the UK, mm -hmm. um, the reality is, is that of that $100, we're gonna take off money for the PBM and we're gonna discount money for the pharmacy and we're gonna discount money for the distributor. So the net net price that is paid between the U.S. pharmaceutical company and in the U.S. versus the U.K. might be, you know, very very small differential. Mm -hmm. But we have all of these layers of supply chain that are not visible. Mm -hmm. And so when we talk about transparency, that's been a big issue. And that's also why, right now, Congress is having a lot of conversation now about the PBMs because they've squeezed all the blood out of the pharma stone, so now they're gonna go over to the PBM stone mm. to try and help right there. But, um, you know, another one of these changes was rare diseases. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we've learned with, I mean, I remember when I first learned about cancer, there were like five, six cancers, and they were all organs. Mm -hmm. right? You had skin cancer, you had pancreas cancer, you had throat cancer, whatever. Now there's hundreds of cancers. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty much the fault of precision medicine, right? We learned more about these, these different types, mm -hmm. subtypes. Um, yeah, if you just look at lymphomas, there's 100 lymphomas yeah. within that world. Yeah. I mean, it, I shared with you, my sister-in-law you know, yeah. lived for a number of years with AML. Right. And you know, they would say, oh, yeah, well, she's a FLT3, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, mm -hmm. you know, I had yeah. to call and you know, have mm -hmm. somebody explain to me what that meant. Um, so. With all of these now rare diseases and subtype, rare mm -hmm. subtypes of diseases, you know, one of the other things is that the IRA with, with their um, artificial structuring of how the pricing works, um, it used to be that if you had one rare disease indication, you were protected. Mm -hmm. But now, if you go to a second rare disease or a second regular disease, you lose your pricing protection, and you're subject to price negotiation. How often do you see drugs repurposed or label expanded to help people with different kinds of cancers? Yeah, all the time. I mean, it's constant. Uh, in, in the blood cancer space, uh, we'll often be apply, applying these therapies before they receive FDA approval. The key thing, to be candid right now is that you get approval by the NCCN, National Comprehensive Cancer Network, which represents 33 of the major cancer centers. When I was at Northwestern, we were part of it, and now that I'm at City of Hope, we're part of it. If it goes on their guideline for a specific disease, no matter how rare the disease, then Medicare feels obligated to pay, and usually the insurers will follow. Uh, there was a visionary, the NCCN has an interesting history, it started about 30 years ago, and there was a concern that the freestanding cancer centers would fo fold because of changes in managed care. It never happened, but they came together and then they had to figure out, well, what's our product? So there was a fellow from MD Anderson, Roger Wind, who came to the group and said, we should put together guidelines of care, since we're the experts say how everyone should treat the disease. And that sounded exciting. And there was a group that wanted pathways rather than guidelines. Pathways being that this is the one way we'll treat everyone. And he's, he was very bright. He said, no, you do pathways, then the payers will only pay for the pathway. Mm -hmm. And if you feel that there's an alternative, they won't pay for it. And so he said, create the guidelines, and then an individual or an individual institution can choose a pathway that they want to follow. And that's how the guidelines ultimately evolved. And uh, when we first started, I chaired the original guideline committee. Uh, we started with breast cancer, and there were like three drugs. You know, now it's all exploded. There's 
and so that 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 part is uh, you know quite exciting to see how far we've come. But you know, and, and we talked when we were getting ready to yeah. sit down together um, about right to try and the fact that that actually came out of a white paper in Arizona. Yeah. Um, and a lot of times I had to sit down in various settings and explain to people that right to try didn't guarantee access. Yeah. Are you all familiar with right to try? Uh, Trump happened to mention this in the debate actually with Biden, uh, where he said one of the things he's most proud of is the right to try, meaning if you have a terminal illness um, and the drug exists and it's gone through phase one trials, it's not FDA approved yet, um, you could get access to be treated with the drug. And he alluded to the, in his mind that there were thousands of people treated. I, I can't give you a number. I can say to you, when I asked at City of Hope how many people we've treated with the right to try, because the, the physician's not obligated to do it, the company is not obligated to give the drug, and the payer is not obligated to pay. So I said, well, how many have we done at City of Hope? And guess what the answer was? Zero. Zero out of you know, hundreds of, of thousands of patients. So obviously it's not being applied. Now we do have patients who uh, will get compassionate use for a drug if they want it and the physician feels it's appropriate and we can negotiate with the uh, pharmaceutical company. It's somewhat similar in concept, but different in terms of the mechanistic part. So it's... Um you know, as we wrap things up, and this has been so wonderful, and thank you so much. Oh, this is an honor for me. Huh? Yeah. Um, as we wrap things up, it, the audience may not know that we have something else in common. Mm -hmm. You shared with, with me. Um, we both write poetry. So since you are our honored guest, I'm going to let you go first. Okay. So, actually, last year was an odd year. I ended up reading more poems than doing medical presentations. <laughs> Never know. But um, so I have a poetry anthology. It's called Heartfelt Reflections. And it's a great story behind it. I had been writing poetry about 15, 16 years. My oldest daughter actually is pretty talented as a poet. And it started with the death of an uncle. And she surprised me one holiday. And she took about 25 poems. She put in a little anthology called Stolen Moments. And she handed it to me. But she also put it on Amazon. So the next thing I, I know, patients would come to me and they say, is this you? So then fast forward to about three years ago during COVID, a patient of many years comes in the hospital for CAR T therapy and says that, uh, have I written any more poems? And I say, well, about 200, they're in a draw. She says, well, she says, I'm stuck here for several weeks. Can I read them? So she reads them. She likes it. Her sister is a professor of Latin studies and she likes it. So she translates all of them into Spanish. And uh, so it's heartfelt reflections. And, and it's, anyway, it's, it's been fun. So I'm going to read two poems. Uh, one is more philosophical, and then one is more pertinent to what we do as doctors and, and to slam bio. So the, this one is called Aging Two. Ask any teacher, lawyer, physician, the plumber who's fixed a thousand pipes, the pilot with endless takeoff and landings, the baker who wakes at 4 a.m. daily, the hooker on State Street, the barber in the mini mall, the street cop directing rush hour traffic, mothers, lifetime soldiers, the homeless man with one winter coat, preachers, sinners, college coaches who no longer know right from wrong, all with the same question, all with the same reflection. Where did the time go? So that is, uh, that's aging. <laughs> And so this one I thought I'd read because uh, Slam uh, Bio, the company we've developed, one of our main targets is leukemia. We hope to make a, a major breakthrough, but this was written about four or five years ago. It's Leukemia Rounds. 15 patients, each with a separate story, private anguish, shared sorrow. Fate or genetics brought you together, snuck up on you, no warning the victim. Too cool, cruel to comprehend, too complex to unravel, too painful to discuss. You lie in bed exhausted, afraid to ask the critical question, will I survive? My challenge, find the answers, structure the cure, hope our mantra, prayer and research both okay. I will never abandon you.
And this one I'd like to dedicate to, to you and well, to you. all of our um, researchers and investors and philanthropists. And um, it's called Never Enough. So each day we have with the people we love is precious and there are never enough. When someone we love lives with disease, we do what we can help and we feel like it's never enough. When every time, as researchers, innovators, healthcare teams, we are not able to conquer a disease in time, we know that for all we do, until we succeed, it's never enough. And so we keep loving, we keep helping, we work, keep working to find answers for when we do, someday, it will be enough. Thank, Thank you. you for what you did. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And with that, that concludes our formal sessions of White Hat. Um, to all of you, thank you for joining us today. Dr. Rosen, um, it, again, it was such an honor to spend time with you. It was such an honor to spend time with all of you. Mm -hmm. And tomorrow morning at Voice of the Patient from 9 to noon on the University of Arizona campus right behind TGen, um, we will hear the stories of patients in their own words. And I hope some of you will join me and we can talk about that now at the reception. Thank you everybody for participating. Thank you so much. Such a